Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we'll be looking at and reflecting on some of the psalms from the Bible, which were written as songs and can still be sung, but can also still be used as prayers. Now, a brief disclaimer before getting into this psalm. The psalms will be numbered differently in different translations of the Bible. This is a very, very old discrepancy. And to help clear things up, I'll be explaining what number the psalm has in the Dewey Reams Bible and in the Revised Standard Version. However, the episodes themselves will list psalm numbers as they're given in the Dewey Reams Bible. Sorry if this is confusing. Anyway, this is Psalm 17 in the Dewey Reams Bible, but Psalm 18 in the RSV. This is also a very, very long one, but I'll try to cover the whole thing in one go. Unto the end, for David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this canticle, in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hands of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. A thorough description of the situation and circumstances in which this psalm was used in its earliest times. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my firmament, my refuge, and my deliverer. My God is my helper, and in him will I put my trust, my protector, and the horn of my salvation, and my support. Praising, I will call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from my enemies. A lot of rich metaphors here. Firmament refers to the sky and its vast array of stars, something that can't be changed by any effort of human beings and is therefore entirely reliable. The terms refuge, protector, and salvation all imply that God takes action to protect him. Deliverer is similar, while also implying that David was previously in trouble of some kind and that God saved him from it. Finally, and perhaps most broadly, are the terms helper and support, both of which imply that God is never our enemy. Not only that, but the term support also seems to imply a force that keeps things from falling into ruin, like a pillar in an ancient temple or a large tent. All of these analogies apply nicely to God. The sorrows of death surrounded me, and the torrents of iniquity troubled me. The sorrows of hell encompassed me, and the snares of death prevented me. In my affliction, I called upon the Lord, and I cried to my God, and he heard my voice from his holy temple, and my cry before him came into his ears. David was surrounded by things that threatened him and inhibited his ability to do good, but when he appealed to God for help, God listened to him. The earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the mountains were troubled and were moved, because he was angry with them. There went up a smoke in his wrath, and a fire flamed from his face. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he ascended upon the cherubim, and he flew. He flew upon the wings of the winds. And he made darkness his covert, his pavilion round about him, dark waters and the clouds of the air. At the brightness that was before him the clouds passed, hail and coals of fire. Again, we see fire being used as part of the description of the incredible power of God, stronger than any mountain, able to easily conquer all the powers of darkness, what's meant by under his feet, driving away dark clouds with the mere force of the light that surrounds him, and with the total authority over the angels that he has, some of whom he rides on through the air. And the Lord thundered from heaven, and the highest gave his voice, hail and coals of fire. And he sent forth his arrows, and he scattered them, he multiplied lightnings and troubled them. Then the fountains of water appeared, and the foundations of the world were discovered. At thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the spirit of thy wrath, more descriptions of the power of God using lightning as a weapon, knowing everything about the world and able to bring forth water and energy from nothing through his commands. He sent from on high and took me, and received me out of many waters. Many ancient writings, including the Old Testament, used water as a symbol for chaotic and inhospitable conditions, since, back then, nobody could live for very long under water. In that context, this verse seems to mean that God saved David from misfortune and chaos. He delivered me from my strongest enemies, and from them that hated me. For they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my affliction, and the Lord became my protector. And he brought me forth into a large place. He saved me, because he was well pleased with me. David had enemies who were just more powerful than him, and yet he survived, and they were defeated, because of the protection given to him by God. The most obvious of these enemies were the giant Goliath of the Philistines, and Saul, the first of the kings of Israel. And the Lord will reward me according to my justice, 
and will repay me according to the cleanness of my hands, because I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not done wickedly against my God. For till his judgments are in my sight, and his justices I have not put away from me, and I shall be spotless with him, and shall keep myself from my iniquity. And the Lord will reward me according to my justice, and according to the cleanness of my hands before his eyes. David recognizes that avoiding sin and evil doing is one of the most important things in the eyes of God, taking good actions and doing God's will. With the holy thou wilt be holy, and with the innocent man thou wilt be innocent, and with the elect thou wilt be elect, and with the perverse thou wilt be perverted. Not that God is actually perverted, but that perverted people falsely believe he is. Holy people can recognize the holiness of God. Innocent people can recognize his innocence, and those who God chooses will also choose God. In each case, we human beings recognize the good qualities of God that we encourage in ourselves. For thou wilt save the humble people, but thou wilt bring down the eyes of the proud. Humble people recognize that they're not the greatest or the best, so a relationship with God is easy for them to accept. However, people who take pride in themselves and their qualities find it more difficult to cope with the existence of someone who is superior to them in every way. For thou lightest my lamp, O Lord, O my God, enlighten my darkness, for by thee I shall be delivered from temptation, and through my God I shall go over a wall. However, God doesn't hold his superiority over people like a bully. Instead, he uses his perfection to help us in resisting evil and achieving our own potential. As for my God, his way is undefiled. The words of the Lord are fire-tried. He is the protector of all that trust in him. That potential is informed by the complete perfection of the way of God, which is entirely pure and free from error. For who is God but the Lord? Or who is God but our God? God, who hath girt me with strength, and made my way blameless, who hath made my feet like the feet of hearts, and who setteth me upon high places, who teacheth my hands to war, and thou hast made my arms like a brazen bow. Hearts refers to an animal with hooves, so David is saying that God has made his feet strong, planned out the perfect path for him to follow, prepared him to face his enemies in battle, and that there is no other God. And thou hast given me the protection of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath held me up, and thy discipline hath corrected me unto the end, and thy discipline the same shall teach me. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, and my feet are not weakened. Again, images of strength, but this time guidance is also implied in the form of divine discipline, which David recognizes as a blessing. I will pursue after my enemies and overtake them, and I will not turn again till they are consumed. I will break them, and they shall not be able to stand. They shall fall under my feet, and thou hast girded me with strength unto battle, and hast subdued under me them that rose up against me. David knows that he'll prevail over all of his enemies with determination, but not because of his own determination. He owes it all to God. And thou hast made my enemies turn their back upon me, and hast destroyed them that hated me. They cried, but there was none to save them, to the Lord, but he heard them not. And I shall beat them as small as the dust before the wind. I shall bring them to naught, like the dirt in the streets. Thou wilt deliver me from the contradictions of the people. Thou wilt make me head of the Gentiles. A people which I knew not hath served me. At the hearing of the ear they have obeyed me. Again, descriptions of how God grants victory to those who follow him, though not necessarily at the time, or in the way they expect. The children that are strangers have lied to me. Strange children have faded away, and have halted from their paths. The people of other lands stopped what they were doing and paid attention, because of how shocking and revealing David's victories were. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my God, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. O God, who avengest me, and subduest the people under me, my deliverer from my enemies. And thou wilt lift me up above them that rise up against me. From the unjust man thou wilt deliver me. Therefore will I give glory to thee, O Lord, among the nations. And I will sing a psalm to thy name, giving great deliverance to his king, and shewing mercy to David as anointed, and to his seed forever. Finally, David praises and thanks God with faith that God will continue to assist him in the future. In short, this is a psalm of praise and thanksgiving for victories, 
both past and future, which is mostly about the amazing actions and qualities of God and the effectiveness of his help against human adversaries. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.